Hi, my name is Dan Nelson. Thank you for joining me for this Airbrush 101. Your introduction to all things airbrush. You probably already know that there are a lot of different ways that airbrushes are used. They're used for uh, doing hobbies, model making, they're used for fingernails, and I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, you're probably very familiar with the people at the fair or the flea market that do t-shirts and license plates. Those guys are awesome. But that's not exactly what I'm going to talk about. We're going to zero in especially on the, the technical how-tos that can apply to all of those various uses. Um, especially focusing in on airbrush use for illustration and uh, perhaps fine art. There are several things that we need to nail down before we get started. One is different kinds of airbrush, and I'm not going to take a long time to demonstrate that, but let me just run through a few very quickly. I don't have here a, a single action airbrush. That is the kind that's usually used, especially by hobbyists, for it, you just push the button down and air and paint comes out. That single action, if you have one of those, everything you learn on this, on this DVD will help you. Uh, but we're going to focus in on dual action airbrush. Let me demonstrate one of those. This is an Iwata. It's actually what I'm going to be using uh, throughout most of the DVD. You, when you push it down, air comes out. And when you pull the trigger back, paint comes out. Okay? I'll do that in just a few minutes. I didn't want to make a noise with the compressor. So that's called an Iwata airbrush. Let me talk about a couple other different kinds. This is a Badger airbrush. And it's very convenient. One of the really neat things about the Badgers is that they have liquid cups that go underneath. When you're involved in a big project, you can fill these up with a, a whole range of colors pre-mixed. And in between each color, you have one, like this one I have right here, that has a cleaning solution in it. And uh, you spray the old color out by spraying the cleaning solution. Get it? So that's a, that is a Pache airbrush. I have here a Thayer Chandler airbrush, a good mid-range. Uh, that thing's about worn out. I've done a lot of miles behind my Thayer Chandler airbrush. And then the Iwatas. Now, I started out about 25 years ago doing airbrush. In fact, the very first thing that I bought was one of those uh, spray can. Have you ever seen one of those? Man, they're great. If you're really wondering if you should get into airbrush and you're afraid to spend too much money, get one of those. Uh, it's compressed air and you stick felt tip markers. Man, just play around with it. You can get into the whole thing for 30 bucks. What a great way to start. Well, that was the first. The next thing I did was a Badger airbrush. And I don't have that Badger brush airbrush anymore. But I will give you this, this tip. Airbrush is one of those areas where you get what you pay for. The more, the more you pay, then it's probably because it's higher quality and you can really feel the higher quality. So there's different kinds of airbrush. There's dual action and single action. We're going to focus on dual action. And uh, there's gravity feed. That means that the, the uh, paint or medium gets sucked down by gravity into the air channel and comes out that way. There's suction, which I showed you with the Pache. And uh, there is a wide range of costs. Now, I want to also talk very briefly, just as we're getting started, to make sure you know what, what you want to get into. If you've already got all your equipment, you may not need this part. But if you're wondering what to buy, just a few, a few tips. And I'll give you my two cents worth, OK? I have here a, a small compressor. This is made by Sparmax. It's a small compressor. I've got it plugged in. Let me turn it on. And this compressor right at the moment is hooked up to my Aztec airbrush. Now, one of the neat things about Aztec is that it comes with a whole bunch of interchangeable tips and interchangeable cups. Really a neat idea and a fairly low, low cost way to get into airbrushing. Now, can you hear that? <laughs> the makers of this compressor have decided that what they should do is put an on off switch. When you're spraying, when you're using it, it'll stay on most of the time. Stay on most of the time. <laughs> and when, not, when you're not using it, it'll go on and off like this. 
Uh, I had a compressor sort of like this several years ago, and the first thing that wore out on it was the on-off switch. So that's something to keep in mind. And I don't know about you, it, it, but that on that coming on off on off that sound I was using this a while ago just practicing it gets irritating to me maybe it won't bother you if so that might be a great option for you let me show you another one this is an Iwata compressor now I would call both of these mini compressors okay this is not what I'm going to recommend that you buy unless you just want to try try something as a low cost entry level product the Iwata stays on the whole time and runs and provides a pretty steady stream of air. Now you might say, well, what's wrong with that? If I'm gonna do, well, if you're not gonna do too much airbrushing, a small compressor like this is a perfectly good option. Uh, the problem with it, the, the stream of air is not quite as consistent as a large compressor. Okay, so let me turn that off. I'm sure that noise is enough for you. Um, let me just talk about large compressors. There are expensive silent ones. And if money is no object, by all means, go buy one of the silent compressors. If money is an object, go to any uh, tool supply hardware store and buy a large noisy compressor. And while you're there, buy about a 50 or 100 foot hose. Now the hose isn't cheap, but it's way cheaper than, a, than an expensive compressor. At, in my studio, I have my, my loud compressor actually is down in a garage and I have a hose running up through the attic to my studio. I can't even hear it come on. That's my solution. Just something for you to think about. Before we go any further, we should talk about safety and masks. Almost all the time when I'm airbrushing, I'll be wearing a mask. Now for, this, for the sake of this video, I'm going to be talking most of the time while I'm airbrushing and it's kind of hard to talk when you've got a, a mask on your face. So let me introduce you to various types of masks and just to make sure I'm making myself clear you're probably familiar with this uh, nuisance dust mask it's called a nuisance mask that's not good enough sorry here's one step up from that this is uh, comes with uh, replaceable filters definitely much better than this but still not good enough and uh, it, it gets painful after a while because these sharp edges cut into your skin what we're really talking about is a respirator or a mask like this. And in fact, this is the kind of mask that you should wear if you're gonna be doing any airbrushing at all. And now you can't hear me, so I'll take it back off. Um, I've got many, many, many hours and miles behind this kind of respirator. Now another solution, if your studio or wherever you're working, if, if you can set up your spray area right next to a window and put a box fan in the window blowing out, that's to me has been the best solution I've ever had for dealing with the overspray. And while I'm on the subject of safety, by no means I would say don't ever spray uh, cadmium paints like cadmium red, cadmium yellow, cadmium orange. Do not spray any cadmium paints through your airbrush and don't spray any cobalts, okay? Those two heavy metal uh, uh, paint colors are toxic and you absolutely do not want to be breathing them in, okay? So that's for what it's worth. That's a little bit of an introduction. Let's take a break and get back to really doing some airbrushing.